Ephesians chapter 6. It's probably a familiar passage to uh, most of you. This is defeating strongholds and what we can do to defeat them in our lives. We can put our armor on. Uh, have you ever been dressed up? You know, we get dressed up sometimes at um, Halloween, putting on different costumes and looking different. And this passage of scripture, we find that Paul is telling us we have to dress up like a soldier, putting on the full armor of God. And there's a difference between putting on the full armor and putting on half or pieces or three quarters or a third or whatever we feel like at the moment. Paul says we have to put on the full armor. And it takes the full armor, you're going to see that in a minute, it takes the full armor of God for us to be able to do what Paul says it does and for us to be able to stand against strongholds in our life and defeat them. We can live in the defeat of those, no matter what they are. And so we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We already know that a few weeks ago we talked about living in the presence of God, living in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is saying, finally now, I want you to do this. Be strong in the Lord. Don't let yourself waver. Don't give up. Don't put one foot in and one foot out. We've talked about all of these things over the past few weeks about strongholds. And he says, and live in the mighty, his mighty power. We can't live outside of that. You know that? There is nothing that we can do without the power and the presence of Almighty God. We can try, but I'll tell you what, we will fail. This morning in the Sunday school lesson kind of touched a little bit on this. If we are outside of the power of God, when we reach heaven, what's going to happen? We're not going to find our name in the book of life, will we? It won't be written down. And so we must live in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Without Him, we can do nothing but fail. But with Him, all things are possible. And all things are done according to His will and His way. And so Paul's instructing us, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Don't let go of that. We need that. We must have that in order to defeat strongholds in our lives. And then he says, put on the part that you want. Did he say that? No, he didn't say that. He said, put on the full armor of God. You know, I'm reminded of David when he was going before Goliath and Saul wanted to put the full armor on him and he's walking out and he's like, ah, uh -uh, I can't do this. He said, this is too heavy for me. I could never reach that giant with all this stuff on. And so he began to take off the armor and what did he go in? The power of the name of the Lord Almighty. And that's what the the full armor of God is. We must have the full armor of God if we are going to be able to defeat strongholds in our lives. We can't, we can't do it any other way. So the full armor of God, and this is what he says, so that you can, what's the next thing? Take your stand. What are we taking a stand against? The devil's schemes. You know, Satan tries to scheme against us. He wants us to fail. He would love nothing more than to come into your life and pull you completely away from God. But God says, don't do that. Paul reminds us, you don't have to live like that. Live in the power of God's mighty strength. In the power of his might. Be strong. Take your stand against those devil's schemes. 
Don't let those strongholds keep cropping up. Stand against them in the power and the full armor of God. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Who does that point to? Satan himself, right? None other than that. He is out there. Jesus said he is looking and seeking and searching who he can devour. He is waiting for you to mess up so that he can say, Aha, gotcha. I told you you couldn't live a life for Jesus. I told you it was gonna, you were going to at some point mess up. Now look what you did. All the people who were watching your life now, they don't believe a thing that you've said. But guess what? Jesus said we have the power of the presence of God to stand up against Satan. We don't have to buy into this garbage. We can stand firm. You know, in, in, in Sunday school, I was reminded, every time we have a lesson, it, it just flows right through this, the message. And, and this, is, this was prepared before I even left on the, mes- on the mission trip. So I didn't have anything to do with sitting in there thinking about what was going to be said, except for being reminded this message follows along with what we were taught in Revelation chapter 3. And that church, what did they do? The church, was it Sardis, right? And the church in Sardis, they had they weren't following what they were taught, were they? They walked away from it, and their reputation followed them. And Peggy asked the question about our reputation and, and what you know what kind of reputation we might have as a church. Because Jesus was speaking to the church. And I said it depends on who you speak to. If we speak to some of us who are in this building, we think we have a wonderful reputation because that's what we like to think. We like to think that we and ourselves have a wonderful reputation, don't we? That when other people see us, they see only the good things that we've done. But guess what? Sometimes there's another side to us that other people don't always see. And sometimes when we ask them, if we ask in the community or if we ask people maybe who years before we're here, maybe if we ask Jesus, that would be the all-important one to ask, what is our reputation as a community of believers? What would he say? We're supposed to be writing a letter to the church, our church, of what Jesus would say to us. I've had some conversations with people in the community, and I'm going to be real. So people in the community don't see our reputation as always being pure. And we may have some work to do in the community to repair some things that happened in the past. And that's okay, because guess who will go with us in his mighty power? God will. He wants his church to be pure. He wants his church to finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Be strong and take your stand. That's how we take a stand. We repent for those things that we did wrong in the past and we move forward. And God, in his almighty power, blesses that when we do it. He says, put on the full armor of God again, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, stand. How many times does he say stand? Take your stand? Stand, be firm, stand? Look at all those. If you have a pen, underline. Every time that Paul says stand, underline that in your Bible. It'll come real to you that I need to stand up on the power of the Almighty God. I can't just be sitting down, and I know Tim is standing up in his heart. We know that. Physically, he may not be able to, but I can see in his heart. He is standing firm for Jesus Christ. And that's where we need to be, standing up for God. We're standing firm with the belt of truth buckled around our waist and with the breastplate of righteousness, the the belt of truth. The truth is the word of God. The truth is God. And so we stand firm with God buckled around our waist. And with the breastplate of righteousness, 
It's covering. Righteousness is covering us. It's our guard. It's our shield. It's what we have in front of us protecting the very heart that we have so that we don't lose heart and grow faint and leave our first love. This is what Paul's trying to tell us here. Stand firm in this. He says, keep the breastplate of righteousness in place. In place. What does that mean? That we have to keep it against us. We can't just lay it on the table and never pick it up and read it. What happens when we don't? We get weak. And I'll tell you what, if you go two days, I can almost guarantee you this, you go two days without being in the Word of God, some things will begin to happen. And you'll be going, where did that come from? Oh, because I didn't have the breastplate of righteousness of truth and the belt of truth wrapped around me. And so all these things took place because I wasn't where I should have been in the Word of God, in a right standing, in a relationship with God in His mighty power. It affects us. I'm telling you, it, it affects us. It affects our witness to the world when that happens. We must go deep in our relationship with God. And, and in our study of the word, and hear from him what he wants us to hear. It's truth that he speaks to us. And then he said, Paul says, and keep your feet, put your shoes on. Down south where I was for the week, they don't wear shoes very often. I found that out. They kick them off every, you know, we went into the house where they were playing uh, the farm, where they were playing their instruments, and almost everybody kicked their shoes off at the door. Maybe some of you do that. My mom used to do that. But in the, in the word, in the spiritual sense, Paul is saying, keep your feet fit with readiness. Readiness for what? Readiness to share the word with someone. Readiness to pray for someone. Readiness to, to just go to heaven. Readiness. You see? My dad used to say to us, we needed to be ready to preach, pray, or die. You're always preaching a message with your life. You need to be ready to pray. Preaching is sharing the gospel message with people. Sharing how they can too also become a believer and a disciple of Christ. Readiness is what we need to have. Are your feet ready? Do you have your shoes on today? I put mine on. I didn't want to walk over here in the rain and get them wet. We have our shoes on. The readiness comes from the gospel of peace. The readiness comes from us reading the word. You see how many times Paul is saying we've got to stay in the word? It's important. It's, it's, I, I cannot stress it enough that without the word of God being in our lives on a daily basis... And even sometimes more than that, as we carry it in our mind, we must have the word to live on, to stand on, to go back to and say, I remember a verse, and here's what it does for me right now. In addition to all this, as if that's not enough. In addition to all this, now you need something that's out in front of you. Take up the shield of faith. Faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Do you hear that? We, and we have to have the faith to believe that someone is out there fighting the battle for us, and who is that someone? God. He doesn't want us to have to lose the battle. He says we should be onward, Christian soldiers. That means we're looking forward. We're going with Jesus wherever he takes us. And so we're, we are, we're ready to go at the moment's notice with him, taking up that shield of faith and letting it go before us. If you have, when those strongholds crop up in your life or creep in, we can say, I have the faith to believe it was eradicated from my life and it stays there. I'm not going to go get it again. I'm leaving it down. Jesus has it. You know what he said about our sins? They're buried in the deepest sea of his forgetfulness. I like that. So when Satan tries to come and 
pull it up from the sea, tell them, ah, that's been buried years ago, and it's going to stay there. Jesus doesn't remember it, and neither should you. And so I'm taking faith, and you're not going to aim that dart at me, because my shield of faith is already out there, and it's covering me. And if you try to get past the shield of faith, you're only going to hit the breastplate of righteousness. You see how that works? That how Paul showed us that for our life? If you try to throw the dart, Satan, you're not going to get me. Because I'm standing firm with my feet, having the shoes of readiness with the gospel of peace. And then he says, take the helmet of salvation. Put on your helmet. I hate wearing hats. Even in the winter, I hate wearing hats. I don't like something on my head. So for my hair. And it'd be a little weird to take that off. But maybe I should do it and support Janet. But take the helmet of salvation. When it was snowing like crazy and I wanted to go out and walk, sure I had a hat on. I didn't want my hair to get wet. I didn't want to be cold. Because we lose the heat out of our head. And But what does the, the helmet represent? If the helmet goes on our head, where do... The darts of Satan fly first in our mind. In our mind. He wants to target our mind and target our thinking. He wants to get us off course in what we're thinking so that we lose track of God and start focusing on the world around us and Satan. And then he can come in and he can attack. And so put on that helmet. Keep it on. Because it's going to be your salvation. It is your salvation. And he says, and then take the sword of the Spirit. So if I have the shield of faith in one hand and the sword in the other, there is, my hands are full and there is no way. I have the instruments I need to attack. I'm sure that when Jim goes out hunting with his bow, he doesn't like carry it, you know, swinging it around or something. He's careful with it. Because why? He wants to aim at the object of it that he's got his eye on and make sure he gets it. That's what we need to do with our sword. Our sword needs to be sharpened so that we can, uh, and the word of God is sharpened. That is our, our sword. We need to keep it so right in our hearts, next to us at all times, so that when we need it most, we have it ready to defend And then he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Once you have all this armor on you, then you pray in the Spirit. In everything, we pray. We pray for people who are sick. We pray for jobs. We pray for health. We pray for, uh, you know, things to be done. We, we, we pray and cover everything in prayer. We pray to be encouraged. We pray for um, family members, right? This morning we were talking a little bit about praying for family members who don't know Jesus yet. We're praying for them. And I want you to know that I'm praying for your family members too. Because I want to see, I'm not satisfied to not see people come to know Jesus. That's our goal in life, right? All of us, not just the pastor, but everybody needs to be praying that they will see Jesus in us. And you know the names of the family members. You know people who maybe are in this community. There's some people that God's laid on my heart. I'm praying for them. So we pray in all occasions. Why? Because prayer is our direct line to God's power and presence in us. If we lose the direct line and we're not in prayer, where are we going to be? Lost. Floundering. Not able to find our way. And then he says, with this in mind, this is the part that really got me this morning as I was reviewing this. Be alert. I said, okay, Lord, that's what I really need today is to be alert. In the tiredness of my mind, I need to be alert. And always keep on praying for who? All of the Lord's people. 
That's you and I. And so if you run out of something to pray or someone to pray for, you can always pray for me. You are welcome and encouraged to do that. Because Satan would love nothing more than to take me, take my eyes off of Jesus and distract me from what he's called me to do. But I refuse, I refuse to listen to Satan. My ears are tuned in to my God, who supplies all my need, who gives me the power and the strength to live for him. And so I want to encourage you this morning to dress every day. Nobody came here with no clothes on, right? We all came dressed. Everybody has every part of their clothing on. Nobody's in costume this morning. So you came dressed today and every day how many of you get up and get dressed every day first thing you do yeah well can you don't get up and get dressed oh he does i could tell the smile on his face we get dressed not just in physical clothes but in spiritual clothes as well our spiritual clothes are more important than even our physical clothes. Because in the end, we won't even have these physical clothes. In the end, we won't. We won't need them. Thank goodness the body's going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Um, but we need to dress while we're on this earth daily with the armor of God. Don't forget one piece. Because if you leave one piece off, Satan will surely come in and attack in that one place. And you'll be without the armor to protect you. And so, be able to fight. That's our, that's our fight today, right? If I had time, I would have written a fight song. I don't write songs. What am I thinking? All right, Sarah, don't laugh. I could write the words, but you can write the music. So we could have, a, you know, there's cheers, right? That we say at school. We have a fight song at school, you know, when you're out there and the band's playing, the instruments on the field. They're playing, they're cheering the team on, right? And that's what we want to have happen. We need to cheer each other on. And in order to cheer one another on, that's how we pray for the Lord's people every day, is to cheer us on with that. And so when we cheer one another on, we're, all, we're encouraging one another to stay dressed in the armor of God. The full armor of God. Let's stand this morning as we close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray that in this day, as we go forward, that we would be Christian soldiers for you. Having every piece of our armor in place at all times. So that we are able to stand against the the things that um, the world or Satan would throw at us, and we can stand firm knowing that your power and presence go before us and come behind us and are protecting us on all sides. And Lord, we will give you praise and honor and glory for it all belongs to you.